Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 83, Space Shuttle Flight 16, STS-51D, Mach 25 Fly Swatter. Last time, we talked about the annoyingly secretive flight of STS-51C. As the shuttle program's first entirely classified mission, not many details are known about the flight, so we didn't have too much to talk about. It probably deployed an electronics intelligence satellite, and definitely chalked up another successful mission for NASA. For this flight, we're back to good old out-in-the-open, unclassified missions. Missions with long interviews and press kits that actually have details. So let's talk about STS-51D, by first talking about STS-51E. If you've never heard of STS-51E, that's not too surprising, since it was cancelled. It was originally intended to fly on Challenger and deploy Tedris B, the next spacecraft in NASA's Tracking and Data Relay Satellite System. Tedris B had previously been slated to fly on STS-12, but was moved after the propulsion system failure of Tedris A's upper stage. Well, it seems that there were still some issues with the payload, so Tedris B still wasn't quite ready. I didn't run down the nature of the problem and if it was with the spacecraft or the upper stage, but the important thing is that Tedris B went back to the clean room to wait for another flight. As part of this manifest reshuffle, the entire crew was moved to STS-51D. Well, except for one payload specialist, who followed his payload onto STS-51G, so I guess we'll see him later. The plan for this mission was pretty typical for the early shuttle era. Pop out a couple of commsats, run some experiments, fly a couple of experiments for students, and be home in less than a week. And as we'll see in a second during the crew biographies, we have a special guest. Commanding the mission was Bo Bobko, who we last saw flying as pilot on STS-6. This is his second flight, and he's still got one more flight in him, so we'll see him a little bit down the road. Serving as pilot was Don Williams. Donald Williams was born on February 13, 1942, in Lafayette, Indiana. Williams graduated from Purdue University with a bachelor's in mechanical engineering before heading off to the Navy. With the Navy, he learned how to fly a number of attack aircraft, completing four Vietnam deployments and 330 combat missions. After that, he graduated from the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School before joining NASA in 1978. This is his first of two flights. Mission Specialist 1 was Ray Seddon. Margaret Ray Seddon was born on November 8, 1947 in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. She earned a bachelor's in physiology from the University of California, Berkeley, before continuing on to med school and earning her MD at the University of Tennessee. She then spent three years working in general surgery with a special focus on nutrition in surgery patients. She joined NASA in the astronaut class of 1978, where she soon put her medical expertise to work helping to develop the shuttle medical kit and checklists, as well as orbiter and payload software and the occasional stint as Capcom. This is her first of three flights. Mission Specialist 2 was David Griggs. Stanley David Griggs was born on September 7, 1939 in Portland, Oregon. He earned a bachelor's degree from the U.S. Naval Academy and later earned a master's in administration from George Washington University. Griggs flew for the Navy for six years, including serving on an aircraft carrier and flying over Vietnam. He joined NASA sooner than you might think, in 1970, where he worked as a research pilot for Johnson Space Center before moving on to help with the shuttle trainer aircraft and finally being selected as an astronaut in 1978. He was slated to fly again as pilot on STS-33, but was killed in an accident in 1989 when flying a World War II aircraft, so this is his only flight. Rounding out the mission specialists was MS-3, Jeff Hoffman. Jeffrey Hoffman was born on November 2, 1944 in Brooklyn, New York, but grew up in Scarsdale, New York. Hoffman earned a bachelor's in astronomy from Amherst College and a PhD in astrophysics from Harvard. A few years after this flight, he'll also pick up a master's in material science from Rice. Hoffman specialized in high-energy astrophysics, so stuff like X-rays, gamma rays, cosmic rays, lots of rays. Before joining NASA, he worked on instruments that flew aboard high-altitude balloons and satellites. He joined NASA in 1978, and before this flight, he worked on, among other things, 
testing guidance and navigation systems, and serving as Capcom. This is his first of five flights. We also have two payload specialists. Payload specialist one was Charlie Walker, who we last saw on his first flight, STS-41D. And if you've been paying very close attention, you can probably guess one of the mid-deck experiments given Walker's presence on the flight. That's right, the Continuous Flow Electrophoresis System, or CFIS, is back. Actually, it almost didn't make the cut when it began leaking in the mid-deck a few days before launch, with the shuttle already on the launch pad. The leak was fixed in time, but even up to one day before liftoff, there was a chance that the experiment would be drained and safed, and Walker would be removed from the flight. Instead, this is his second of three flights. And completing our crew, Payload Specialist 2, Jake Garn. Edwin Jake Garn was born on October 12, 1932 in Richfield, Utah. He attended the University of Utah and earned a bachelor's degree in business and finance. Not the typical degree for an astronaut, but okay. Next, he joined the Navy, where he served as a pilot for four years before taking it down a notch to the Utah Air National Guard while he went to work in the insurance industry. Hmm. From 1972 to 1974, he served as the mayor of Salt Lake City before being selected by the voters of Utah to serve as senator in 1974. Wait a minute, this guy's an astronaut? (laughs) Okay, sort of. Hang on. Yes, Jake Garn, senator from Utah, was chosen to fly on the space shuttle as a payload specialist. There are a couple of different ways of looking at this. One is to cynically say, wow, so this politician gets to use his status to write himself a ticket for a -a once-in-a-lifetime experience. And let's be honest, there's something to that. Garn is definitely only on this flight because he's a senator. Notably, a senator on the committee that decides how much money NASA gets. But I actually think there is a case to be made here for his inclusion. As usual, it helps to try to take yourself back to this time and place and put yourself in the shoes of NASA decision makers. Let me be clear, this is just me speculating wildly, but I imagine that the internal debate wants something like this. Hey, this senator wants to fly on the space shuttle. What? No, this isn't an amusement park ride. Well, he writes our checks and says he wants to see how all the money's being spent firsthand. Does he even have any aerospace experience? Actually, yeah, he's a Navy pilot and has over 10,000 hours of flight time, That's more than some of our people. Doesn't matter. We have limited slots and a whole bunch of talented astronauts waiting for their chance. Soon we'll be flying over a dozen times a year. There'll be plenty of slots. And imagine the impact of someone who has actually experienced spaceflight and actually seen the Earth from space being in the Senate. He speaks their language. He could be a really big help. Plus, we have a seventh seat that isn't being used on this flight anyway. Well... I guess we do have some medical experiments we could use him for. Again, this is just me making up dialogue between two fictional NASA decision makers, but I think it's probably somewhere in the ballpark of what actually happened. There was definitely some politicking in there, but it doesn't seem like the craziest thing ever. So does Garn deserve his seat? Maybe. But in any case, about ten weeks before the flight, Garn was given a chance to fly. He began training, mostly on the weekends to avoid conflicts with his Senate duties, and learned the basics of flying in the space shuttle, not flying the space shuttle, which I'm guessing consisted of a lot of don't touch this button. According to fellow payload specialist Charlie Walker, he understood his position as a likely unwelcome outsider, stayed quiet, did what he was told to do, and made the observations he was there to make. (laughs) Needless to say, this is Garn's only spaceflight. Fast-forwarding 10 weeks, while STS-51E ran into enough issues that it was eventually cancelled, STS-51D launched right when it was supposed to. Well, almost. It was delayed by 55 minutes, either due to bad weather or due to a ship rudely wandering into the SRB recovery area. I've seen both reasons given by NASA sources. Anyway, four years to the day after STS-1, on April 12th, 1985, at 8.59am, Space Shuttle Discovery lifted off for the fourth time. The ascent was uneventful, and since it was a direct ascent, no Ohms-1 burn was required. Shortly after main engine cutoff, however, we get our first bit 
of unscripted excitement. Normally what happens around Miko is this. The SRBs are long gone, so it's just the orbiter and the external tank, with the orbiter sort of hanging underneath the tank. Shortly before Miko, the stack is rolled so that the orbiter is on top. Then the main engine's cut off, and the connections to the external tank are severed. The orbiter blips the RCS thrusters down, and then begins to move up relative to the external tank. The tank then goes gently tumbling away until burning up in the skies over the Indian Ocean half a revolution later. Right after separation, two tile-covered doors swing into place and cover the umbilical wells, the spot where liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen is transferred from the external tank to the orbiter on its way to the main engines. That's the plan. Instead, on this flight, shortly after ET jettison, the orbiter suddenly rolled 45 degrees to the side, and the umbilical well doors didn't close. This is not good. So what's going on? Well, as usual, when something that used to be working just fine suddenly breaks, the first question is, what changed? And it turns out that for this ascent, a little experiment was being performed. The space shuttle was an experimental vehicle, and these types of little tests weren't all that unusual. In this case, a procedure was being tested related to TAL and RTLS aborts. This is covered in more detail in episode 68, STS-1, but the space shuttle had a number of different abort modes, methods for handling an emergency during ascent and getting home safe. TAL, which I'm not at all sure I'm pronouncing correctly, stood for Transoceanic Abort Landing, where the shuttle would hop across the Atlantic Ocean before landing on one of several specially chosen runways in Europe and Africa. RTLS stood for Return to Launch Site, and before SpaceX started doing this on purpose with Falcon 9s, it was an acronym that would fill any space fan's heart with dread. That's because an RTLS abort was a highly dynamic and intricate series of events where any number of things could happen, and very few of them were good. John Young summed it up as six miracles followed by an act of God. This is relevant since one big concern for any pilot making an emergency landing is the weight of their vehicle. For passenger planes, making an emergency landing early enough in the flight poses a problem because the plane might have too much fuel and weigh too much to safely land. But how does that apply to the space shuttle? The engines are on the orbiter, but all of the propellant was in the external tank. Ah, well, not quite all of it. With so much propellant being used so quickly, the numbers start to get a little crazy. The result is that if you add up the propellant that's just in the relatively short pipes between the external tank connection and the main engines, it adds up to a few thousand pounds. Which brings us all the way back to this experiment. The plan was to test a system to automatically vent this extra propellant right after dropping the external tank, so a busy crew wouldn't have to deal with it during an abort. But somewhere along the line, something got missed, which leads us to our surprise. During an actual abort, the propellant lines would have had a chance to depressurize a bit before being vented. During this launch, they were not. So when the prop was vented, it vented hard. Hydrogen doesn't weigh very much, so only 67 pounds were vented out of the umbilical well on the left. But oxygen weighs kind of a lot, so almost 3,300 pounds were vented out of the umbilical well on the right, which rolled the orbiter, all 200,000 pounds of it. The mission report didn't say if the roll was to the left or right, but since the oxygen was where most of the mass was, and it was on the right, I'm going to go ahead and say that the roll was to the left. No harm was done, but an unplanned 45 degree attitude slew is pretty huge and pretty scary. Oh, and I mentioned that the doors didn't close, but I already spent kind of a lot of time on this section. The umbilical wells didn't close at first, so the crew employed everybody's favorite technological panacea and turned the motors off and on again. And they closed just fine. Flight day one, as usual, was filled with activity. Immediately after arriving in orbit, one crew member, doesn't mention who, but I'd guess Seddon since she's a doctor, opened a locker on the mid-deck and used the American Flight Echocardiograph Experiment to take a look at their heart. The idea with this experiment was to study any changes in the heart's performance and behavior as the body adapted to spaceflight. 
It was performed right after orbit insertion, halfway through flight day one, right before bed on flight day one, and then once a day for the rest of the flight. Actually, while the plan called for one crew member to be examined, with others as time allowed, they managed to perform an echocardiogram on four members of the crew on most days of the flight. More data, more better. Also on the first day was our first of two satellite deployments. Telesat I, aka Annex C1, was spun up, kicked out, and sent on its merry way. I think we've covered the Annex satellites enough, and this one worked just fine, so we'll just wave goodbye. Less successful was the second satellite deployment taking place on flight day two. SINCOM 43, or LEESAT 3, since every satellite seems to have 14 different names, was the latest in the SINCOM series of communication satellites. These are those bigger satellites that are deployed with a frisbee like spinning throw. The satellite left the orbiter with no difficulty, but shortly after that, the crew radioed down that the expected Omni antenna deployment did not take place. Not a good sign. As usual, the pilot crew hopped the orbiter away to a slightly different orbit in order to open up some distance before the satellite's upper stage fired. But that also didn't happen. While the crew went about their business, folks on the ground got to work figuring out what happened. So let's leave the ground people to their analysis and get back to them later. When students are learning about physics, it's common to simplify problems in order to really focus on the core concepts. Actually, that's not just true for students, that's pretty much how all physics and engineering is done, really. Sometimes this leads to strange scenarios like a spherical cow traveling through a vacuum with no gravity, or something like that. But not many people have first-hand experience with weightlessness. So how can students hone their intuition and test their theories about the behavior of simple systems in a weightless environment? Well, how about we send some simple systems to a weightless environment and film it to show the students? And better yet, let's send some simple systems that everyone is familiar with. Toys. Yep, NASA sent this crew into orbit with a box of toys and the goal of filming them in action so teachers across the country could use the footage in their lessons. Bo Bobko demonstrated a spinning top and some gyroscopes. Don Williams showed off a spring-wound flipping mouse and paddle ball. And the press kit said that he was going to try juggling, but I have no idea how that would work, and it doesn't show up in any of the video footage I saw. Ray Seddon showed off a slinky and played a game of ball and jacks, plucking the stationary jacks out of midair. David Griggs demoed a yo-yo, presumably being extra careful while swinging a hard object around the small cabin. Jeff Hoffman played with some magnetic marbles, a spring-wound car on a forever looping track, and a wheelo, which is apparently the name for that thing with the two metal rails and a plastic spinning thing connected to the rails that goes back and forth. <laughs> it's tough to describe. Just do an image search on wheelo, and you'll be like, oh, that thing! Even Jake Garn got in on the fun, folding a paper airplane and letting it drift around the cabin. Poor Charlie Walker got no toys. All of these activities were included in the always fun post-flight presentation video, which future me will tweet along with the episode link. As usual, you can find that by searching Twitter for the username Space Above Us. Toys are fun, but we still have an issue with that Syncom satellite. What to do? After analysis from the experts on the ground, the conclusion was that a switch lever had not been flipped. This switch was responsible for kicking off a sequencer that controlled the series of events that activated the spacecraft, deployed the antenna, ignited the upper stage, you know, all the stuff that didn't happen. I don't have a schematic or anything, but I believe the way this works is that as part of the deployment process, something in the support equipment would flip this switch as the satellite was pushed out of the orbiter. I believe the idea is that it's an extra layer of safety. Without flipping a physical switch, then there isn't even the possibility of the sequencer doing something wrong and, like, lighting the upper stage while still stuck in the payload bay. So, alright, the switch wasn't flipped. How many astronauts does it take to flip a switch? Either for crew safety or just due to the geometry of the switch, I'm not sure which, 
the decision was made to use the remote manipulator system, the robot arm, when attempting to flip the switch. But the RMS wasn't really designed for that. The end effector, its robot hand, is a cylinder over a foot wide, and is designed to grab grapple fixtures and trunnion pins and stuff like that. But don't worry, the ground had a solution. Bringing back memories of Apollo 13, it was once again time to bust out the duct tape and start tearing covers off of in-flight manuals. Following a series of instructions from the ground, helpfully sent up to the shuttle's onboard printer, the crew crafted two devices known as the Fly Swatter and the Lacrosse Stick. For a mental image, well, really just imagine you made a big fly swatter and lacrosse stick out of duct tape and cardboard. I can't really paint you a better word picture than that. They looked decidedly homemade. I'll be sure to include a photo with the episode announcement tweet. And if you're listening to this years from now and Twitter is a long forgotten memory, just do an image search on STS-51D fly swatter. You'll be sure to find it. Fly swatter instructions weren't the only thing to come out of the orbiter's printer. This crew had not planned on doing orbital rendezvous. They weren't really trained for it, and they had no checklists and procedures on board to do one. Luckily, the way shuttle crew training works means that each crew ends up learning a fair amount about the missions immediately preceding their own. Since it takes effort to simulate the missions, each crew practices the upcoming missions before their own mission is added to the training process. This results in them getting lots of little pieces of a bunch of missions, in addition to the deep dive on their own. So they weren't completely unfamiliar with Rendezvous, and Bobco and Williams had soon maneuvered the orbiter up next to the forlorn Syncom 43 spacecraft. Fly swatter and lacrosse stick done, Rendezvous performed, it was time for a space shuttle first, the shuttle program's first contingency spacewalk. Lucky Ducks, Griggs, and Hoffman suited up for an EVA that nobody expected for this flight. After making their way into the payload bay with the duct tape and cardboard contraptions, they attached them to the end of the robot arm using some straps and more duct tape. Griggs and Hoffman closed the airlock after three hours outside. Bob Cohen Williams moved the orbiter in close, and Seddon used the fly swatter equipped RMS to reach out to the stricken commsat. After relearning orbital rendezvous on the fly, constructing some improvised devices, and performing the program's first contingency EVA, the sequencer switch was flipped. And nothing happened. <laughs> Bummer. The crew had no choice but to back away and leave Syncom stranded in its low Earth orbit. But don't worry, we'll see it again a few missions down the line on STS-51I. Before we head home, I suppose we should answer the question I posed at the start. Was Jake Garn a good payload specialist? Again, according to Charlie Walker, he took his training seriously, eagerly participated in experiments, and knew to stay out of the way of the mission specialists as they went about their work. I also wonder if it was worth having someone like Garn around to do medical experiments on. Again, this is just sort of me thinking off the top of my head, but if they could do space adaptation medical experiments on a payload specialist with free time, leaving the mission specialists able to work on other tasks, that probably isn't the worst thing. And actually, speaking of space adaptation, Garn made a notable contribution in this area, the Garn scale. Getting a zero on the Garn scale means that you are not at all space sick. Getting one Garn meant you were as space-sick as it was possible to be. Despite all of his years in aviation, Senator Garn's stomach did not agree with weightlessness. Which, as NASA researcher Robert Stevenson pointed out, is probably useful data since it shows how even the most hardcore Earth-bound pilots might not adapt well to space. At least for a few days. Two days later than planned due to the unexpected rendezvous, and one rev later on top of that due to weather, Discovery performed the deorbit burn and the crew of STS-51D were on their way home. Six days, 23 hours, and 55 minutes after lifting off, Discovery's wheels touched down at the shuttle landing facility at the Kennedy Space Center. Just before the end of its nearly 12,000-foot rollout, the crew was suddenly reminded that the mission's not over till it's over because in the final seconds of rollout, the brakes on the nose gear locked up, 
causing the tire to drag across the runway, which eventually caused it to burst. There was a lot of damage to the nose gear, but the crew and orbiter were fine. But thanks to this incident, all landings would be at the wide open runways at Edwards until STS-61B near the end of the year. Spaceflight always finds a way to catch you off guard. Next time, Space Lab is back in the payload bay and Challenger is back on the launch pad for STS-51B. And if you think two weeks is a long time to wait for this next episode, try talking to Don Lind. He waited 19 years. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass. Thank you.